Challenges were provided with an environment that had been subject to numerous compromises. Essentially, if you will, a library of all the real-world problems I've seen on Linux systems in the wild collapsed down into one individual virtual machine. Points were then awarded for the number of problems detected, explained, and where appropriate, a remediation and prevention strategy detailed. Analysis was permitted both on a live basis and on a static basis, and to score maximum points you need to use both techniques. In this video I'll give you a quick overview of some of the kinds of problems that you might have uncovered and what you might need to look out for on your Linux system. Given that we're working with a snapshot of a virtual machine here, we can afford to relatively liberally explore the environment and we can always revert back if there are problems. First things we might want to get familiar with our user account, what permission level we have, what items exist in our directories, um, perhaps we'll want to look at the network ports that might be listening on our system and figure out what's, uh, what's working here, and maybe we'll want to have a look at what processes are running on the system if we suspect something is wrong. Here we note that ps-aux doesn't behave as expected and return a list of results, and ps also seems to give very unusual formatting and some rather erroneous data, considering I've just booted up this system. If we, uh, we go and run PS directly, we get the more expected result, implying there's some kind of redirection going on here. If we look more closely at our environment, we'll note there are a number of interesting aliases here that's redirecting the PS command to a cat of slash Etsy slash PS. And also a couple of interesting commands we'll come back to in short order to do with S traces for SSH and SU. If we go to Etsy, we can have a look at uh, PS and see that it is indeed the process listing that we were, we were looking at. And if we look carefully at uh, PS, we can see that it was created by main user and perhaps some interesting timestamps that could help us in our later forensics environment. So first things first, whilst there are lots of methods to do this, checking out the user environment and looking for signs of misdirection, not necessarily trusting the tools that you're presented with, was a key aspect of this particular test. Continuing this theme of not necessarily trusting the environment and the tools that you'd normally rely on, if we look at our alias command again, we can see we've got a couple of odd S traces here. So that any time we run perhaps SSH or SU, this uh, S trace command is going to output a debug log for the process to this location. So we can test this ourselves by perhaps trying to sue to the root account. Now in this case, uh, we're going to use a password that is incorrect as I don't have the root password for this system. But if we move into the temp directory, we'll note that following the syntax, there is an supwd9783.log, a bit of rudimentary logic to make sure the files don't stomp on top of each other, or at least the chances are minimal. If we have a look in our supassword.log, as expected, we get a nice verbose log. Now this is capturing everything that's going in and out, so anything we type um, on the keyboard would be captured. And if we look for the password challenge that we saw um, in that particular dialog, you can see that um, there is then the passing of the string that I typed, Forensics Challenge 98S, which was the password that was used for this particular account. So what the bad guys have done is using tools that are built into many, many Linux systems, they've created a make-do keylogger for some specific processes just by redirecting some of our environment variables. So really important to be careful about the utilities that you're using and trusting, because of course, this would look perfectly normal and allow you to SU to the root account, leaving this nasty little log file behind for the attackers. You might want to have a look at what's running on the system from a network perspective. And here we can see there's a series of different things listening, including one on port 8080, and it's weird that we can actually list the program name. It's running at my privilege level here, nc.traditional. Um, if we dig into this a little bit more, perhaps using ps, of course remembering that ps has been hijacked by the bad guys, so we're going to use the normal version and list out the processes, we can see that ukcsc is running nc.traditional-e slash bin slash sh listening on port 8080. And that dash e tells netcat to pipe out to a shell prompt so that we can type in our own commands. We can see that Netcat is indeed um, listening and working on this system. So if we connect to localhost on port 8080, 
then we can actually do an LS and we can start navigating around the system using that back door. Um, so clearly we've got someone who's installed a, a nasty back dot here using Netcat. Again, continuing that theme of using tools that are often built in and hidden in plain sight. Whilst it's tempting to focus on high-end, super clever attacks, often on these Linux systems, the bad guys will leave really quite obvious trails. Now, we know this UK CSC account has done some nasty things, and that netcat command was running, giving people backdoor access to the system. So if we have a look at what this command has done, sorry, what this account has done, we can see a list of everything that's been run. Now, this is really easy to fake, but here we can see some odd commands that the bad guys have been running and they haven't bothered to obscure, including this ssh command uh, in my home directory, which is a bit weird because I'm not familiar with a, uh, a backdoor account or the use of ssh on this system. If we look closely, we can see that I've got a .ssh file hidden from the normal directory listing. And that's weird because that would normally be a directory rather than a file. If we open it up, then we can see it's a, an RSA private key. So that's pretty strange. If we repeat the syntax from the command that we saw in the history, we'll see that we're able to connect to the local host as the backdoor user without a password. They've left themselves an account they can connect to later. And this account has a, pri a higher working privilege than the previous one, from which we can do much more. So often the bad guys will leave really obvious signs in place if you bother to just go and unpick them. Now we've got this backdoor user, there might be other traps in the system to enable us to get to a higher privilege level. Maybe getting into the main user account, given that we know this was involved in creating Etsy PS, which was that fake file listing that we saw for the PS command earlier. So maybe they've left something that enables them to inherit permissions somehow. There's a special property that can be set on shortcuts that enables a user to inherit some effective permissions. And what we can run here as the backdoor user is a command just like this to look for files with that special property. And when we run it, sure enough, we notice slash home slash main user slash dot bash file, which is clever because it's hidden unless you run ls minus alh and look for files that have a dot in front of them. If we run that dot bash file with an appropriate argument, and then, also helps you type the command right, and then check the ID, we'll note that we're no longer the backdoor user in our effective permissions. We've now inherited that of main user. Again, conducting a privilege escalation just by existence of that file. So it's always really important to evaluate the permissions on a Linux system. And throughout this challenge, there are another, a number of other examples just like this. Now, so far, I've shown you things that relate mostly to the environment and Linux itself, but there were lots of daemons running in the, uh, in the environment here, from Apache through to FTP services, all of which had configuration issues to be identified and perhaps attacks. And one of the things you could do was carve up log files to try and get information. If we have a look at Apache's log file here, we can see it's been absolutely hammered. Someone's been running a tool called Nikto, over this web server to try and identify vulnerabilities. We can see telltale signs of things like directory traversal. If we carry on through, we'll find examples of confidential information being posted out that we could troubleshoot. We'll find examples of denial of service and all kinds of other attacks from a multitude of sources. If we take out our, our Nikto here for a second and just look at what else we have in the log file, we'll note right up at the top we have a couple of interesting entries. Um, a rather obvious um, and rather strange post, funny how people normally call their files something very helpfully descriptive with the sensitive data they contain, and a get to default.php for the 200, which is a little weird because I don't really use PHP on this particular web server. When we have a look at other PHP instances in here, we'll notice an even more concerning example, slash CGI bin slash version dot PHP. And I really don't like the look of these commands down here, and they've had a 200 showing that they've actually worked. If we open up Mozilla Firefox here, you can see that I've pre-prepared a copy of this command, version dot PHP. I've got cat slash Etsy slash password, but I could just as easily make this 
ls minus alh, and I can essentially run any command that I want. But interestingly, if you were to access it without knowing the syntax, then the script returns absolutely nothing and avoids any contact. So if we go to the location of my CGI bin directory for Apache, you'll see version.php created by root in a similar time frame. So we know our attackers are running at some nastier privilege level here. And if we have a look at the script, we can see it's a very, very dumb script that just takes in that command variable and then executes it on the local system. So there are lots and lots of different ways that backdoors could have been built into the system, including using the web server that, of course, makes it really easy for the bad guys to log in and do nasty things afterwards. There were lots of other kinds of issues that you could find in this system, some of which would actively fight back against you. A little bit of scanning of the system, for example, would find that if you connected to the local host, you'd be able to get a dump of the Etsy shadow file with all the password hashes. Interestingly, when you actually went to modify this file to clean it up as part of your remediation, you'd find the backdoor user would keep getting added. And a little bit of searching using timestamps and permissions would quickly make you realize that there was a scheduled job running. And uh, you could see this particular file had been modified with opt.routinescheck.sh. And if we navigate over to this hidden directory, we can see there's a check.sh script and a pwd.temp and shad.temp as well, which would constantly add the backdoor user back to the system in the event that you tried to clean it up, trying to work around your efforts. So the system had both a live and, as well, a, a static analysis component to it, where you were looking for files that perhaps had already been deleted. So I've shown you a very small percentage of the overall number of points that could be scored. But critically, looking at your environment, looking at date stamps, timestamps, comparing the system to comparable clean systems and looking at the differences were all techniques that would enable you to identify these configuration failures. Being familiar with demons like Apache and VSFTPD would also gain you points in identifying common configuration failures. Take a look at the top 10 tips for securing your Linux system that I've included in the blog post and a little more information on the remediation strategy. Good luck in next year's Cybersecurity Challenge.